Chapter Twelve of the Moving Picture Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corrie Samuel. The Moving Picture Girls by Laura Lee Hope. Chapter Twelve: The Photodrama. Mr. Devere was an excellent actor. In his time, he had played many parts. So the necessary action, or business, as it is called, was not hard for him. He had learned readily what was expected of him, and though it seemed rather odd to make his gestures, his exits and entrances, before nothing more than the eye of a camera, he soon had become accustomed to it after the days of rehearsal. And the great point was that he did not have to use his voice, or, at the most, when some vital part of the little play called for speaking. He only had to whisper to give the cue to the others. The plot was not a very complicated one, telling the story of a wealthy young fellow, played by Paul Ardite, the son of a wealthy banker, Mr. Devere, getting into bad company, and how he was saved by the influence of a good girl. The card in question was a visiting card, which seemed to compromise the young man, but the turn of it cleared him. To save time. Different scenes had already been set up in various parts of the big studio, and to these scenes, mere sections of rooms or offices, the actors moved. With them moved Russ Dalwood, who was filming this particular play. He placed his little box machine on its tripod before each scene, and used as many feet of film to get the succeeding pictures as Mr. Pertell thought was necessary. I presume all my readers have seen moving pictures many times. And perhaps many of you know how they are done, but at the risk of repeating what is already known, I will give just a little description of how the work is done. In the first place, there has to be a play to be filmed or taken. It may be a parlor drama, an outdoor scene, anything from a burning building to a flood. With the play decided on, the actors and actresses for the different parts are selected and carefully rehearsed. This is necessary, as the camera is instantaneous. And one false move or gesture may spoil the film. Next comes the selection of the location for the various scenes. Indoor ones are comparatively easy, for the scenic artist can build almost anything. But to get the proper outdoor setting is not so easy, and often moving picture companies go many miles just to get the proper scenery for a background. So careful are some managers that they will send to California or to the Holy Land. In order that their actors may have the proper historical surroundings, this costs many thousands of dollars, so it can be seen how important it is to get the film right at first. There are two main parts to the moving picture business: the taking of the pictures, and later the projection or showing of them on a white screen in some theatre. For this, two different machines are needed. The first is a camera. Similar in the main principle to the same camera with which you may have taken snapshots, but there is a difference. Where you take one picture in a second, the moving picture camera takes sixteen. That is the uniform rate maintained, though there may be exceptions. And in your camera, you take a picture on a short strip of celluloid film, or on a glass plate. But in the moving picture machine, the pictures are taken on a narrow strip of celluloid film. Perhaps a thousand feet long. The camera consists of a narrow box. On one side is a handle, and there is a lens that can be adjusted or focused. Inside is varied machinery, but I will not tire you with a description of it. Sufficient to say that there are two wheels or reels. On one, the upper, is wound the unexposed film. One end of this film is fastened to the empty or lower reel. The film is passed back of lens, which is fitted with a shutter that opens and closes at the rate of sixteen times a second. Turning a handle on the outside of the camera operates it, so that when the scene is ready to be photographed, the actors, whether men or animals, begin to move. The handle turns, and the unexposed film is wound from one reel to the other inside the camera, passing behind the lens, so that the picture falls on it in a flash. Just as you take one snapshot, but as I have said, the moving picture camera takes snapshot after snapshot, sixteen a second, 
until many thousands are taken, so that when the pictures are shown afterward, they give the effect of continuous motion. The film is moved forward by means of toothed sprocket wheels inside the camera, the shutter opening and closing automatically. When the reel of film has all been exposed, it is taken to the dark room, and there developed, just as a small roll from your camera would be. This film is called the negative. From it, any number of positives can be made, all depending on the popularity of the subject. To make positives, the negative film is laid on another strip of sensitive celluloid of the same size. The two films are placed in a suitable machine, and then set in front of a bright light. The two films are then moved along, so as to print each of the thousand pictures previously taken. The positive film is then developed, fixed, to prevent it from fading, and it is then ready for the projecting machine. This latter is like the old-fashioned stereopticon, and by means of suitable lenses and a brilliant light, the small picture, hardly more than an inch square, are so magnified that they appear life-size on the screen. That, in brief, is how moving pictures are made and shown, but it tells nothing of the hard work involved on the part of operators and actors and actresses. Often the performers risk their lives to make a snappy film, and many accidents have occurred where daring men and women took parts with wild beasts in the cast, or dared serious injury by long jumps. Ruth and Alice watched their father enact his role. He did it well, and the girls were gratified to hear Mr. Pertell say from time to time, "'Good! That's the way to do it! Oh, that's great!' The play was not a long one, but if it had taken three times the half-hour it consumed, Ruth and Alice would not have been weary. The last scene had been filmed by Russ, who was getting ready to take his camera to the dark room for development, when there came a crash from where Mr. Switzer was going through a love scene with Miss Dixon. "'Look out!' someone called. There was a sound, as of rending, splintering wood. "'Oh!' screamed Miss Dixon. "'By goodness gracious!' ejaculated Mr. Switzer. "'I'm caught fast!' "'Oh, what has happened?' gasped Ruth, clinging to Alice. "'It sounded like an explosion,' the latter answered. "'Don't be alarmed,' Russ assured them. "'It's nothing. Only Switzer leaned too hard on that fence, and it went down with him.' And that was what had happened. Amid the wreckage of the property fence, which had collapsed with the weight of the German actor, sat he and Miss Dixon, while the manager, with a gesture of despair, exclaimed, there's another scene to be done over. I knew that would happen, observed Pepper Sneed gloomily. End of chapter twelve.